Hey everybody, welcome back to a brand new episode of Mike Adelic. I'm Mike Brancatelli. Got a great guest for you today. Recently had the pleasure of speaking with the amazing, the wonderful, the multi-talented, multi-dimensional spiritual business coach, Beth Weinstein. And uh, we had a great conversation. You guys are going to love it. And all of the links, everything that you want to find out about Beth is going to be in the show notes. So go down there. You got all of her links. You'll find her everywhere. LinkedIn, Medium, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, her website. You know, everything is there. I'm trying to keep the intros to be a little shorter. So I I don't think I'm going to kind of, you know, go on about who she is and everything because that's what we're going to get into in the podcast. But I'll just say that I had a great time talking with her. She's got an energy about her positive energy it's infectious it's uh it's electric and no wonder why she is where she is because she is helping tons of uh people with uh people entrepreneurs entrepreneurs are people with people too uh (laughs) aspiring entrepreneurs coaches spiritual leaders and healers align with their purpose and grow their business so that they can help more people um, and that you can earn a living and thrive with your passion. Um, And it's funny because we connected uh, over something more personal with me and, and then, and she had actually helped me. So uh, if she could help me, she could help anyone. That's, I mean, that's, that's a real Testament. I think if you could help this stubborn, ignorant fool, (laughs) <laughs> then you can then you can help anyone um but yeah she's she's just fantastic and i was just so happy to talk with her it was just such a great conversation so before we get into it uh align yourself with some of my sponsors support the psychedelic spiritual conscious sacred business that i have here and go to sheathunderwear.com sheathunderwear.com and put in the promo code mikeadelic at checkout to get 20% off the most comfortable pair of underwear that you could ever wear. It's it's amazing and they are spiritually aligned. Actually, hey Beth, I might have another client for you here. Um <laughs> they 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 are spiritually aligned. They have a flower of life um boxer brief print that I absolutely love. I wear it too much. Uh, actually, Sheath, if you could send me a couple more pairs, that'd be great because uh, even though you have moisture wicking fabric and uh, amazing technology with the dual pouches to keep everything comfortable and smooth, you know, these are really, at first I was kind of skeptical. They looked kind of stupid. You know, I was like, what is this? I think that's always my reaction with things that are trying to push the envelope and innovate in the space. I'm always like, ah, come on with the pouch thing and all this stuff. It's underwear. You just wear them. However, you don't have to wear them with the pouch. That's number one. And number two, so it, it helps to wear them with the pouch, especially if you're working out, if you're boxing, if you're running, if you're, um, you know, just a generally sweaty mess. <laughs> they they are going to make you more aerodynamic. You're going to be faster. You're going to be lighter. Sheath underwear provides you with that moisture wicking, comfortable fabric that helps activate your chakras and your pineal gland. You're going to start seeing in eight dimensions when you wear sheath underwear. You're going to be more aligned with your vision, with your purpose when you're wearing sheath underwear. Sheath underwear legitimately is one of the most comfortable pairs. No, no, sorry. The most comfortable pair. I have to say it because it's true. It's the most comfortable pair of underwear. I, I wear them all the time. I wear them all the time. Sometimes I just wear them around the house. I wear them to, I wear them to bed. Actually, I sleep naked when I go to bed, but they're my pre, <laughs> pre-briefs pre before. They're my lounge material. I wear them when I'm working out. They're great. Everybody needs underwear. What are you going to do? You're going to buy one of those like 10 pack Kirkland underwear that are basically made out of cardboard and sandpaper and it's scratching up your, your, your parts down there and making it all itchy and red. It's disgusting. We don't want to go into it. You know, the struggles, you know, the trials and tribulations of finding a good pair of underwear that allows you to have freedom of movement, freedom of movement, moisture wicking, get that sweat out of there get cool air down there, get nice circulation going. It's tremendous. And they have a pouch and you can put your uh, testicles, I'll use the proper scientific term for it, in the pouch. But, uh, you know, it's a pouch in your underwear. So, and this is a psychedelic show. You know what I mean? 
We all like going to music festivals and having a good time. So get a pair of sheath underwear when all that stuff opens up and you're going to have a great fucking time. Sheathunderwear.com. That's the, the website. Sheathunderwear.com. The promo code is Mikeadelic. Get 20% off. Check out Mushroom Revival as well. Get 15% off mushroom products. Check out Student Loan Tutor. Shout out to Zach Geist and the Debt Shamans doing magical works of wizardry over at Student Loan Tutor. If you have student loan debt, just go there. Get a free evaluation. Tell them I sent you, okay? I get nothing from this. I'm paying it forward. Charles Eisenstein, gift economy, shout out, model going on there. So that's about it. You know what to do if you love the show. Leave a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts. That helps boost us up in the algorithms and the rankings. Like, share, subscribe. Tell people about it if you really enjoy it. And uh, if you got some feedback for me, I'm open. I want to talk to you. Message me. Go to Patreon as well and be- consider becoming a patron. I don't think that you can search for me on Patreon. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have some words with the pa- people at Patreon because... I don't know why. I potentially might be shadow banned. I'm not really quite sure. However, the link is in the bio. Go, uh, link is in uh, the, the show notes. Go to patreon.com slash Mike Brank. We're doing all kinds of awesome stuff over there. I got new stickers coming in. I got t-shirt design ideas that I'm collaborating with some awesome artists to make some really dope shirts, like really cool shirts, not like just standard shirts that say Mike Adelic on it, just some really cool trippy stuff. And then also... I have my new comedy podcast, Dosadelic, that I put out mostly on Patreon. Some episodes are released on the main Mikeadelic feed, and I'm really loving it. And a lot of people are really enjoying it, too. So check that out. All the links are in the show notes. If you're inspired, if you're moved, if you have feedback, if you want to talk, all the the ways to do that are going to be in the show notes. So uh, go there, get in touch, leave a five-star review, and I'll see you out there. Without further ado, let's get in this conversation with the magical, wonderful, multidimensional, multi-talented Beth Weinstein. Psychedelics are illegal, not because a loving government is concerned that you may jump out of a third-story window. Psychedelics are illegal because they dissolve opinion structures and culturally laid down models of behavior and information processing. They open to us the possibility that everything we know is wrong. We don't need new laws that control our consciousness and rigidly place it in a prison. Cognitive liberty. The fact that as adults, if we're not hurting anybody else, we should have the right to explore the contours of our own consciousness without any mediation or legislation on the part of somebody else. Reject the authority. Authority is a lie. Voice of perception. Information is power. But we have to seize, seize the opportunity. The opportunity. The opportunity. So anyway, we already established we're anti-vaxxers, we're right-wing, right-wing QAnon supporters. We're what else? What else can we throw in the mix there? <laughs> I know that's why I was like, oh my god, just because I'm asking about like why he got it. Um, yeah, I think he's. You know, I think my family is a little like, oh, you went on an airplane twice now, and I'm like, dude. I have so I have this friend who's like a healthcare entrepreneur who has been taking airplanes the whole entire time with his newborn baby and everything. And he's like, the air filtration systems are the best in the world. He's like, just wear a mask, wash your hands, don't do stupid things, you know? Yeah, I mean, that's that was like the advice that we were getting from the get-go. And so, yeah, I mean, I, that's pretty much like what I've been doing too, is, you know, stay safe and do the best you can. And, and uh, you know, yeah. what else can you do? Got to keep but yeah, it's... You got to keep living. Yeah, I'm going to be going to Costa Rica soon. And yeah. um, so I'm excited for that. And uh, but yeah, it, it gets to this thing where people like it's hard to kind of like hold the gray area and the nuance. You know, obviously, we've seen a lot of that. Uh, happen, yes. You know, it's kind of like humanity's thing. But anyway, that's it's maybe that's a good oh, yeah. segue into talking with you, because <laughs> one of our first conversations was kind of like around my old money story 
<laughs> and and that's like we we linked up and we talked about that. And so I was thinking maybe maybe we can get into some of that because I think it could be really helpful pe- for people in the psychedelic spiritual consciousness space to have a better relationship with that stuff. So maybe we'll hop into that. But first, we should just get started with uh, who are you and what do you do and what brings you here today? Thank you so much for having me here, Mike. So I'm Beth Weinstein. I am a spiritual business coach. I help current and aspiring entrepreneurs start and grow their business so they can make money doing what they love. I tend to work with people who are starting up um, coaching, healing, and similar transformational businesses. I do work with a lot of psychedelic entrepreneurs, people on the medicine path, um, because I do talk, I guess now, very publicly about this interconnection between working with psychedelics and coming into your heart and really following that path of um, what I believe is like a higher purpose, meaning following the path of joy, you know, stepping into what you really want to be doing on earth versus, you know, getting caught up and just surviving on the rat race wheel, but really thriving and creating, it tends to be a lot of entrepreneurs creating a business that you really love. Um, so that's what I help people do. That's what I'm up to. I also, I've produced a few summits around this topic called psychedelic sacred medicines, purpose and business. I have a new podcast coming out in about a month, I think, in a few weeks, a month, um, which will be, it's called The Psychedelic Entrepreneur Medicine for These Times with Beth Weinstein, because I do believe that the medicine is within all of us. And I do believe that right now, especially people who are on this path of psychedelic awakening or whatever we might call it, um, you know, you have a lot of medicine to share within you. And a lot of people who've gone deep into this you know, spiritual awakening or consciousness expansion, see that there's another way to live besides slaving away at jobs that they hate and, you know, being part of the system that really isn't serving them or the earth or humanity. So a lot of people are called towards what I call conscious entrepreneurship. And this is where I believe you become the medicine, like you share your medicine and that's it, you know, and that's what attracts clients to you. This is what helps you grow a business. Obviously there's a lot of how to's with that, but you being your authentic self and your authentic truth and sharing your greatest gifts that are living inside of you. I do believe that's really the purpose of humanity, like being a human. Um, you know, it doesn't mean that everybody's out to save the world. It doesn't mean everybody needs to be the next, whatever, um, massive, you know, tech, innovator, but it just means following what's inside of you. So that's, that's what my, I'm really all about. That's what my biggest passion is. And, um, yeah, I'm excited to share more here with, with your audience. Awesome. Yeah. Um, was this always a passion of yours? Was this something that, is this just kind of like who you are? I mean, I guess maybe following your own advice if this is who you are you're you're following that kind of energy and that joy that comes with doing what you do and helping coach people and get people to get the you know get the most so they can make the the businesses that they dream of has that always been something that you've been interested in or yeah it's so it's i always tell this story so when i was a little kid i grew up in suburban bay area california like house 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 kind of place and um my best friend and I, we lived two doors away from each other. We used to play this game um, <laughs> that we called City. And we used to, instead of having like kids and playing house, we actually had this, we had businesses. We both had businesses and we both had these little airplanes that we would fly all over the world and we would sell things on the street constantly. Like we had a, a street with a fair amount of traffic. And so we were these very young entrepreneurs. I think we did this from ages like seriously six to like until we started doing, you know, more adult things like 12 or 11, like boozing and doing drugs. But um, I'm kidding. (laughs) But so we played this game and we would fantasize about having businesses and, and making money and like flying all over the world. And I knew as a young kid when people would say, what do you want to do when you grow up or what do you want to be? I used to say that I wanted a business. I didn't know what kind of business. I didn't know what it looked like. But here's the weird thing that that has always kind of just, it's interesting to look at. I used to say at a very young age, 
well, but I don't want to be the person in charge of the business. I want to be the person like helping the business grow. Like I wanted to be number two behind, you know, behind the scenes. And interestingly, that's actually what I ended up doing in my corporate career. And then I went from corporate to tech startup world and I did the exact same thing. I, I've always just helped businesses grow and scale in a variety of ways. And then after launching a few of my own businesses, I accidentally fell into business coaching and, you know, I've always, so I've been working with psychedelics since the age of 14. I'm now in my forties. We'll just say that like, <laughs> um, and you know, it's definitely been a deep part of my life. You know, I went to study psychology in college. I thought for a while I'd be a therapist, um, until, after like four years, I couldn't take any more of the writing papers. <laughs> but, um, but you know, this was always a big part of my path was expanding my consciousness, like, like on a very deep spiritual path from a very young age and always questioning the mind and life and what it's all about. Um, it's always been in my nature. So when I, by the time I accidentally fell into business coaching, I was already very deep on, I mean, I was already very, very deep on medicine paths to begin with. Like, long before that. But what started happening with, with this coaching and the medicine is that everything just started feeling much more aligned with who I was. I was already running a different business. I was starting to get sick of it. I, you know, I thought I would do it forever, but I was really not, it wasn't aligned with who I was anymore. And I kind of reached a point where I was like, okay, now what do I do? And this is where you know, the coaching just started landing in my lap. Like I started getting clients without trying. Um, after a series of, you know, hundreds of people would just contact me asking me for help. How'd you start your business? Can you help me? You know, can you have coffee with me? Blah, blah, blah. And then I would see some of my friends, especially people within like the medicine community and all these spiritual communities I was part of. I would see people with their own businesses and I would watch them really struggle. And <laughs> I remember one of the, the first people I was like, how much are you making? And I think she told me like four or $500 a month. And I was like, oh my God. And so I was like, well, wait, I know a lot about this. Why don't I just help you? So I spent, you know, I just set aside time and went and taught her all these things and helped her and her business completely took off. Like I have so many stories around even that, um, how, like little tweaks and little shifts and even mindset and implementing certain things. So I just kind of fell into this by accident. And then after, you know, I was already coaching people for a few years and, you know, I was going pretty deep with medicine, like on a, a new deeper level, like going to Peru and doing dietas. And I, I started kind of having these, you know, downloads, as they say, downloads and also starting to feel it inside of me because it's all the same thing that um, what I would notice is people would go on these huge, powerful experiences, like going to Peru for two weeks, and they would complain about their job or their, you know, what they were up to in life. And then they would go have these powerful experiences and they would end up doing the exact same thing that they always did. Like they would literally not make any changes. And I was like, what is with people? Like, why is everyone doing all this mind expanding work and all this deep spiritual growth, if they're like not actually implementing it into their life, like integrating it and making the changes that they want to see. Cause then it's like, you know, so I started questioning, I'm like, why do other people do all this? But then they're not making any changes. So for me, I was always this kind of person that would like make change. Like if I wanted something, I would always go after it. If I wanted to make a change, I would just do it. Sometimes it would take me a while. Like it took me eight years to start my first business, but, um, you know, but, or actually, I mean, technically way longer since I was a kid, but, um, but you know, if I put my mind to it, I usually just went after it. Even if it failed, I didn't really care. And what I started noticing was this pattern in other people where people just got paralyzed and they got stuck and they got, you know, caught in fear. And so I started, you know, feeling this need to talk about the psychedelic path and your work, like quite literally, you know, at least here in the U S working is a big part of people's lives. You know, it's like, it's the Western culture, right? We spend eight to 12 hours a day working, you know, back when I worked in corporate, it was like these 12 hour days. And so, yeah, if you hated your job, you were pretty much a miserable person all the time. 
So I started kind of questioning it. And then I started telling some people, I was like, you know, I feel like I, I want to do this series. Cause I was already running series. I, I had done like four different like summits and series um, about spiritual entrepreneurship before that. And I had already started talking about my own psychedelic, you know, medicine path, but I didn't really go full public because I was like, well, you know, maybe I'll just be that like weird one that is the only person that feels this way. I mean, I actually really thought maybe it would be me and like 10 people that that agreed. So, but it was one of those things where I was like, well, you know what? I have to just go talk about this and give it a try. And if no one resonates with it, fine. At least I know. Or maybe there's going to be people like me who agree that there's some, you know, reason to start talking about this, especially, you know, three or four years ago when this was starting to come up, you know, the mainstream media was talking about psychedelics more than ever. You know, the conversation was getting a little more mainstream. It was getting a little easier to start sharing. And I was like, well, you know, why is everybody talking about depression, PTSD, and anxiety. And what about all these other people that are working with psychedelics? Like your day-to-day anxiety, like your day-to-day anxiety at work or your misaligned career. So that's kind of how I I fell into it. And then I did the series and um, yes, there were definitely more than 10 people that that thought it was worth talking about. Um, You know, I've interviewed some really great people like, you know, Rick Doblin and Paul Stamets and David Bronner and um, Allison Gray. And yeah, I mean, people were like, of course, these medicines wake up something inside of you that's here to call you to a higher purpose. And then also, how does this connect with the world that we want to create, you know, and like what the changes we want to see on this planet are. And that's where on a deeper level, I was like, how I started wondering, like, how are these psychedelics going to actually affect the world at large. And I think they're actually going to have a huge effect. And I think they already are. So I was like, let's just start talking about it. And that was it. (laughs) Yeah. Amazing. I I always like, I always find that once you kind of open up and, and, and come out, so to speak, you know, the psychedelic closet, (laughs) I think, I think Rick Doblin actually said that. Um, Then you find like, it's like, people are like, Oh, great. Now I have permission to talk about it. (laughs) Yeah. Because somebody, you know, started talking about it. And now, like you said, now the atmosphere is so much different. Like I get messages on LinkedIn all the time from people that are like, I see you're in the psychedelic space and I want to, you know, talk about something or whatever. Usually they don't really apply because they, they don't really look into what I actually do. But yeah. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of like energy out there, right? And that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. And there's money involved and money is a representation of energy exchange. And it's kind of the thing that makes the wheel turn and move. So, you know, in a sense, I've had sort of an awakening uh, when it comes to like business and money and things like that, because I I definitely at one point thought like, well, I'm just going to kind of like peace out of here and maybe just live in, in like Costa Rica or like not or like live in like Bali and just be on like a perpetual kind of vacation, but that's obviously not realistic, right? Um, well, <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, maybe if you're still, I if you're still being productive and doing yeah. stuff, like, but I was thinking of it more from like the like who needs this stuff, man? Like, oh, I'm yeah. gonna just like bounce out of here and I'm just gonna like live on like a commune or something, totally. and, you know? Um, so yeah, so. So it sounds like uh, maybe, well, I'll ask you this question. Did you get this kind of entrepreneurial spirit from your parents growing up or your family or was it teachers or where did this come from? Was it just divine intervention? (laughs) You know what? So it's so funny. Um, And again, none of this came up until, you know, whenever it was 10 years ago or 12 years ago when I started my other businesses. So my dad had that very typical like work for one company his entire life and I always wondered if, I don't know if he really loved it. Um, I think it was good enough, you know, it made him happy enough and satisfied. So he was kind of in that realm of like, you go to college, you get a job and you just stay there and suck it up until you retire. I mean, he literally told me that he died 15 years ago and he, he kind of actually told me something like that on his deathbed. And I remember being like, what? But the funny thing is, so my brother, who's four years older than me, went to college 
went to go get a J-O-B job and lasted about five months and he quit and became an entrepreneur. And of course, my parents freaked out. Um, well, we just, you know, sent you to college and now you're going to go into construction. <laughs> and of course, he's like, he's never been out of work in construction. He's made really good money and has does a really great job. And he's owned a business ever since that day. Um, For me, it was this long, painful process of sucking it up and hating my life and um, going down, you know, the the rabbit hole into like drug abuse and alcohol abuse and other abuse and different forms of numbing. But what's interesting to me, there's something I had forgotten about that didn't come up until I launched my last business um, in about 2013. My dad had actually gone and launched a magazine and I forgot when I was a kid, he like, I don't really even know the whole story because I was pretty young, but I do remember him working on it and I remember it coming to fruition and I don't know how long it lasts. I think there were a few editions out, but it was this like super niche magazine and um, I remember him wanting to do that. You know, he was also a woodworker and kind of an artist and So I think there was something in him that wasn't really satisfied with just being in that corporate grind. I mean, thankfully, he had a decent corporate grind where he got to travel and didn't work crazy hours. But um, another thing that I also thought was really interesting, my great grandmother, who I had never met, um, but I actually look somewhat similar to her. She was, you know, back then, no women didn't work, period. But she supposedly, um, my aunt tells me she supposedly used to like say, um, say things like how she wanted to be, I guess she wanted to be a lawyer, which out of all the things I'm like, wow, that sounds terrible. But, you know, she kind of had that, um, that something inside of her where she wanted to work and she wanted to build a career. But back then, you know, you just raised kids. I mean, she was like, um, I think first generation or second generation immigrant, you know, kind of lower middle class Chicago, like inner city. And you just dealt with it, you know, like dealt with the kids and cooked dinner and your husband worked and that was that. And I, it's interesting because my aunt is also an entrepreneur. Um, my mom has, you know, even though she was like housewife for many years, went back to school and did her own thing, became a stockbroker. I mean, it's really interesting because we were raised with the values of like, no, you just do the safe thing. And that's like, all all that matters is like the security. But the irony is everybody else in my family, like my aunts and uncles, I have an aunt and uncle, they're entrepreneurs. Like, you know, I'm like, what went wrong with this message? But I think a lot of people of at least my age group, you know, in this generation, we were all raised with this like, false belief in quote security. You know, this is back in those days where, you know, I was living probably like you, Mike, at one point I was living in New York. I moved to New York city during the the dot com days. And I was going to like dot com parties and like, you know, this is, um, Clinton administration. Everybody had money, like jobs, jobs were so easy to get that I bounced a job to job to job. And I made tons of money at a pretty young age, you know? And so back then it was kind of like, well, this is the easy way. Like you go to college, you just get a good job and voila, you make a lot of money. And then all of a sudden things started changing. You know, it's like, (laughs) then I was there for 9-11. I was there for, you know, the economy tanking a few times. I was there for other disasters. And then now, you know, COVID, I was like, dude, if people don't see that there is no such thing as security anywhere, like when are they going to see it? You know, there really isn't. I don't believe, you know, I, I mean, even now it's like teachers' jobs are questionable, you know, maybe, I don't know, nurses maybe have secure jobs, but most nurses I know hate their job. You know, it's unfortunate. Um, same with doctors even it's, it's an odd thing. So I just, you know, that's where I start to question this whole, um, mentality that a lot of us were raised with, with like, what is, what is work all about? What is abundance all about? You know, is it about the money or is it about your time or is it a balance of both? You know, that was one of my my biggest issues having a J-O-B was like, I mean, I couldn't go to Burning Man. I finally went to Burning Man four times, but years I couldn't go to Burning Man because I worked in the fashion industry and it was literally during fashion week. I mean, come on. That's Mm. terrible. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, totally. I mean, and you make so many good points there. And I, I like, I feel that too, because I grew up with that. 
you know, when you're a kid, you don't really know. You just hear the messaging that you get, right? But like what you were saying, I sensed things too. Like I sensed that like, well, my parents are not really happy and they sure as hell enjoy doing these other things. Like, um, and I, I, I think I pretty firmly believe that everybody has some kind of deep passion within them. Um, but again, it's that kind of like, well, it is, what are you going to do? It is the way it is, you know? And <laughs> I think we, you know, like we're, we're definitely, I think ready, more than ready to move past that. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, like you were saying, it's like, if we haven't seen it by now, I mean, shit, like I, I graduated, uh, college in 2009 and, uh, was my plan was like, I'm going to move to New York city. I'm going to get a job in advertising. I'm going to be like Don Draper, just like on TV. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just like such an idiot, but I, I didn't know. And then the, the, it was in the, you know, the economy was tanking. Yeah. It was, it yeah. hit the toilet. And so like literally I had, I remember applying for a job, at the New York times, and they were like laughing at me. They were like, are you kidding me? Like, we're not hiring anyone. We're firing people. <laughs> so it was just, um, yeah. And, and it, you know, it's mm -hmm. part of societal norms and stuff. So you must see that. Is this what you see? Like, what's a big, maybe you've seen this as a question with clients that has come up. I'm curious to know, like, what a common thread is or a common theme is. Maybe, or maybe there's differences between when you first started and who, who, what you're seeing now or who you're working with kinds of people and things like that. But is this like the, the story that you hear often too? Wait, which one? Which story? The one about the security and the... Yeah, about like the 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 security oh. and and having the job and and that sort of thing and wanting to pursue their passions and not knowing. Yes. I mean, this is I would say about 90% of my clients are making that transition from a job or something, you know, some sort of life that wasn't really aligned with who they were. Um interestingly, some of my clients have misaligned businesses where they kind of fell into something, you know, honestly, it's a lot of, um, a lot of people work with their hands and they're, they're on their feet, like body workers, acupuncturists, you know, these, which, you know, I think the world needs acupuncturists and body workers, but after you do body work for 20 years, you know, you get a little bit burnt out and you realize it's like, okay, even your body starts to hurt. Mm -hmm. And then also a lot of people on this path get to a point where they're like, I know I have more to give than just sticking needles in someone, or I know I have more inside me than just giving amazing massages. Um, so yes, I hear this all the time. I actually tell people, look, the best time to start a business is when you have a job. Um, you know, don't quit your job and then start, but make the transition, which is a, a huge amount of my clients. And then there's definitely, I have a handful of clients that were like, well, I've already kind of lost everything through COVID or even before that, you know, like my security has gone away. So I'm using this opportunity to like wake up and look at what I'm doing. I mean, that's kind of what happened to me in 2011, was it? In 2011, my, the company I was working for got bought out and, you know, I, I which I suspected was actually coming and I suspected there were going to be layoffs. So I kind of planned my getaway and I was like, you know what, this is my now or never, I either make a career change or I'm going to get stuck in this easy, you know, the cycle of like easy jobs that I hate. Um, so I just, you know, I had to take that plunge, you know, and I changed, I went to work for tech startups and took this huge pay cut, but I was so much happier. You know, it was a much, much better industry for, you know, outside of the box thinkers. But yes, I hear this all the time. And you know, I do believe that, especially in the last year with people really getting a lot of wake up calls to, you know, oh, I thought things would be great, but all of a sudden my business has declined or work has dropped off or they don't, you know, like tons of layoffs or whatever it is. So they're just like, well, you know what, I'm going to start a business because I've wanted to this whole time anyways. You know, a lot of people say that like, or they've try to start their business, you know, one, two, three years ago, but they haven't really been getting any traction. You know, there is a point where if you're not making money in your business within like one to three or four years, like you definitely are, you know, that's where you have to learn something. Like there must be something missing or some, you know, way of monetizing or a strategy or, or something, or there's something misaligned in you and the business, which I've seen happen with so many people. It's like, if you're doing a business 
that you think is just about making money and you're not making money, then you're not going to make money anyways. Cause it's not aligned with like what's really in you. You know, I always say you have to wake up in the morning and be inspired to get to work. Like I, I have never, even with my last two businesses, you know, there were definitely days of that, like, Ooh, I can't wait to work. But I remember getting like, ugh, like that dread even with business. But this business I have, I, I usually have to stop myself from working. Like I get excited to go to work, you know, like I usually, if I don't have something to do, like if something isn't going on in my business, I actually get like lost and bored very quickly, you know? So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm constantly inspired and excited and that's where it becomes, it doesn't become work, you know? Like right. I don't feel like my business is work. I feel like it's just part of my life, you know? Totally. Yeah. 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 It's fun. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's like once you get rid of these labels, I feel like, cause they carry such heavy loaded sort of energies with them. Right. So instead of saying it's work, like it's just, you're doing what you love to do and you happen to get, uh, an exchange for that. And you put forward energy and people give you energy in return. That's mediated by currency. Like it's, we have all these like abstractions and symbols and everything. When you, you break it down to its simplest form, yeah. I mean, I feel like that. I feel like when I like my life is great. Like I love it. It's yeah. sure I could. I'd love to make a little bit more money, and I'm sure there's some things I could do. I got some great tips from Beth Weinstein about. It. Oh, yeah. there. Yeah, yeah. That's right. I'm talking to you right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, that that is do, like. What, what do you think has, I'm curious to know, like the kind of evolution and like the merging or the synergy with, uh, the plant medicine work that you've done and sort of like business and entrepreneurship, like were there moments where you had like really deep insights or kind of like, you know, like, Oh, this is what it's about. You know, like this is, this is what I believe. This is what I want to put forward. And, and do you still carry those with you today? Or do you have oh new ones God. that are epiphanies that are coming to you? <laughs> Quite literal epiphanies. Yeah. And I, it's so funny because I'm usually like, well, I don't want to be so cliche and say that the medicine has told me everything, but you know, it's definitely contributed a lot. And I do believe that this is what a lot of people are experiencing, you know, especially if it's happening to you multiple times, like getting the same message over and over and over and over. It's like, how many times do you need to be reminded till you finally start seeing it in your day to day. Um, so yes, yeah. I actually multiple times, there was this one moment though, that was so significant that every now and then I just call it back in or I'm like, Oh yeah, that, you know, like that energy where I had this vision. I'll never forget. It was like, um, it, I think it was my first dieta in Peru and you're like in the jungle, like the real deal in the middle of nowhere. And um, what were you dieting? Um, so are you allowed to say what you're yes, dieting? Yes, I am. Yes. I, I love sharing. Um, I usually at that year, I think I was dieting Boban sauna mm -hmm. with, um, uh, hold on the, um, Renikia. And I think there might've been a third one. So I've done Boban sauna every year I've been there. Cause she's like incredible. Um, but I don't know, maybe it was, there was another year where I did these other two plants in addition to the Boban sauna, but I don't, I think it was the first year I was there. Cause I remember it was the last ceremony, which takes place in the morning, <laughs> very early, um, in the daytime. And I remember laying on this bench outside of the ceremony space, you know, looking up at the beautiful trees. And then I just had this vision and it was just showing me, and I was still running my former business at the time. And it was just showing me what life would be like if my work was just pure fun, like literally just fun. And it was showing me this vision of like, <laughs> um, hopping around, like skipping and dancing out in nature and like helping a bunch of my friends, you know, that was, you know, the sim symbol it showed me. It was like, what if I just hung out with a bunch of friends and helped them and was able to live off of that? You know, and of course that doesn't seem real. I was like, well, you know, that's not a reality. But what I did with that is I remember, it was such a profound feeling, the feeling of like excitement and joy and fun and like just doing what comes naturally to me and what feels really good and following that. So I actually went and did this experiment where I was like, you know what? 
why don't I try living my life like that? You know, obviously I was still working and running my other business, but I went and just lived with that energy of like, what if I just followed where the fun was and the joy? And then that's when things just started taking off and getting really easy. You know, um, I didn't really have to question myself so much. I, you know, even like launching new things, like I'm about to launch a podcast and I'm like, I don't know, you know, who knows what's going to happen, but I have to just do it. Cause I've been thinking about it for two and a half years, you know? Um, so it was kind of that same thing where I took it as kind of this surrender experiment of what would happen if I just said yes to things that sound fun and interesting, including, you know, including things where I didn't know if there was money coming from it. You know, I said yes to a few opportunities where I was like, well, I don't know if I'll be making money, but maybe I should just do it because it sounds really aligned with what I want to do. And then, you know, lo and behold, like doors would open and magic would happen. And then, you know, like this would lead to that or like a client would come in or, you know, it's, you don't know. And so this is one of the things that I I've gotten so much from the medicine is really, just trusting in that feeling. And of course, it's so hard to say that because it sounds so like spiritually bypassy and white privilege. And actually, I mean, I I do believe that if all of humanity, if there was a way everybody could actually see that what would like what life would be like if we actually did just listen to what was inside of us and follow that, I think we would actually have world peace, you know? And I do get the realities of paying the bills and having food on the table. But at the same time, I do believe in the, the power of the mind as well. And I do believe we can all create our realities. Like, you know, and I mean, there's stories of this every day of people completely coming out of absolute poverty and becoming multimillionaires or, you know, um, dyslexic Richard Branson, look at him now. I mean, I've definitely had those rock bottom points myself. My God, there was there were times where I've like literally run out of money. Like, oh, and yeah. I've at, yeah. yeah, I've been at the rock bottom of like alcohol and drugs and like self-destruction. I mean, I've been down all of these paths of like near suicide and, you know, but I, thankfully I knew I always had this place in my mind that was like, no, like I know I can get myself out of anything. And I do believe all humans are capable of this. And I don't believe by, I don't believe in living by circumstance. You know, there's always a way if you really think creatively. So um, those are some of the things that medicine taught me. And then essentially, you know, and this is the one where I'm like, look, guys, I don't care what psychedelic you're doing, but they're pretty much all saying the same thing about, you know, the, the heart path. Like when you feel something in your body and you feel lit up and inspired and excited, like pay attention to that. You know, like, mm -hmm. and it doesn't mean that you're going to know how things turn out, but there's, there's usually something in that, you know, that's where I've had like random job, you know, back when I actually worked jobs, like I've had random jobs come to me and like met the random people or like a random opportunity or like money here, money there, like by just kind of being curious and having fun and saying yes. And like, not getting caught up in the fear so much. And I do believe that that fear is what holds back so many, uh, you know, so many people on this planet. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Yeah. I was just like, what you said actually just struck me deeply because got to, got to give a shout out to my man, JC, not Jesus Christ, Joseph Campbell, even better, uh, <laughs> who says, follow your bliss, right? And you will find that doors open where there were only walls before. Mm. And I, I find that to be true every time. Every time I listen to my heart, I listen to my gut, I listen to that small voice that says, just go, just do it, that magic happens. Mm -hmm. Most of the time, magic happens. And when I don't, I suffer immeasurably and I am left I've been to those places that you've described as well, okay. um, which has been really dark and really bad, but has also informed me to come out and rise, rise up and, and get out of that. And, you know, um, and you said that we could have world peace. Um, and uh, then you said something about like white privilege, which leads me to think that, yeah, like we all have, we do have privilege and what a great gift it is to be able to use that privilege to make something, to build something up, to, to get resources, to accumulate some kind of, of wealth, and then 
if you really care, then give back and mm-hmm. fund things that you love and inject energy, yeah, exactly. into into growing. And then it doesn't mean that everybody's out for themselves because what's 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 going to be a better world? People pursuing their bliss and creating what they love, or and and then like you know being there for each other and supporting each other when need be. Or everybody just being miserable and working jobs they hate, and then that ripples out, and everybody's mad at each other, and then there's the violence and depression. That's so that that hit me when you said that because totally. it made me think of that, and yeah, totally, totally, it. And I agree. It's like the more you know, it's interesting. I've always, you know, I mean, I come from very typical like middle class, like not high, not low, but just middle, like pure middle California suburbs. Um, but I've always had these like rich friends, like, you know, I mean, even going to school out there, it's like, there's always those couple rich kids, right. That are like unusually rich. Um, and I have, I have this one extremely wealthy friend who's also cool as hell. And, you know, and I've been around a lot of his friends over the years and it's just so interesting to watch people with this much money who are of, you know, higher values of, you know, conscious entrepreneurship. These are the ones, these are the people that are actually changing the system because he takes his money. And I witnessed this firsthand on many, many levels, all the money he has, he keeps fueling it back into startups, into projects he believes in nonprofits, you know, psychedelic research. I could go on and on, you know, and the other people that I've seen him around are like, social entrepreneurs, like literally starting new, you know, social projects that will change the face of, you know, sustainability and business. I'm like, yes. So I do believe that the more money that's in hands with people of these higher values, like that's the key. Like when I interviewed David Bronner, that's what it was all about was about, okay, the reality is capitalism is not going to fall overnight. I don't, maybe it will. (laughs) Maybe I keep waiting. Maybe that day will come, but right now we have to figure out, okay, these things are here. You know, money still exists right now. Consumerism is still here. Capitalism is still here. But what is, what is the way that we do it with more values and with consciousness and with, you know, um, the greater good, in, you know, in concern for the greater good versus just, okay, like the people who are out to just steal and make money and whatever. But no, there's actually leaders in this world who are out to make change. But the only way they can do that is by fueling things with their power, their money, their influence. And that's those, thank God, these people are rising up more and more every day. You know, not everybody is like the evil insert corporate slash government name here, evil person, but you know, there are people actually trying to change systems. You know, the first thing I said to Bronner, I was like, okay, great. You guys have this huge sustainability program at your, at your company. I said, are you going to teach this to other companies? <laughs> Cause it's not just like, okay, one great company. It's like Patagonia is doing great work. Even I worked for the gap ones. Even the gap has pretty decent business practices. At least they did. But, you know, now it's about, okay. And he said, yeah, there's actually someone exploring how to then bring our model to other companies so they can be more sustainable, fair trade, you know, whatever it is, you know, putting their values in, paying people, everybody, I don't know if you know this, everybody seems to know this, they actually pay very well at that company, you know, they're paying way above minimum wage. And it's like, it's not about throwing business away, like you said, because I know um, the, the medicine has done this to me where I was like, you know what, fuck it. I'm just going to get rid of it all and move to the middle of nowhere and play a guitar on a mountain. That's actually one of the reasons I also did my series was I saw those two extremes is people staying stuck at the business, the job that they hate, or they want to check out and just bypass all of life, which of course sounds like the great way out, but it's, that's not creating change on the planet. Like me going and playing a guitar and checking out of society, you know, I don't know what good that's really going to do on a larger scale. So that's where I do believe getting, using the money for the goodness, you know, using money to fuel, you know, the, the projects that you believe in the organizations. Like I donated the most money I've ever donated in my life last year. Like Even like things that, you know, some guy in my, some guy who lives somewhere near me, the local flower shop sent an email that said, so-and-so was in a bike accident. I was like, I don't even know who this guy is. Let me donate. You know, here's his GoFundMe. 
You know what I mean? And it's like yeah. donating to, you know, Shakruna places I believe in, you know, social justice. Mm-hmm. This is the mm-hmm. power. And this is why I believe that it's like, it's about having the money into people with the, the values, you know, and the, this, whatever I sometimes say, like, give the money to spiritual people, you know? <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's, it, I mean, well, Dr. Bronner's is, is awesome. I love their soap. Yeah. And, uh, um, yeah, and they, and they do a lot of great things. So it's, yeah, I mean, the, well, I just thought about like, if you were just, uh, on the mountaintop playing guitar, like maybe you would just be like, so amazing that like so many people would come and then just be like healed instantly by your healing music. That's possible. <laughs> I mean, like, no, but you totally make a point because it's these extremes. And like we were talking about before, there's like a lot of nuance. There's a lot of gray area. And I think it's maybe like a natural reaction that happens is like when you get frustrated with something, you're like, that's it. Like I'm going to this side of things. Um, but then you see that you know, that doesn't always uh, work out yeah. that well. And there's this great essay. Uh, I forget who wrote it. I think it, I think it was Frederick Bassiat. It wrote this essay called uh, "What Is Seen and Unseen," and he's talking about. Um, I think he's talking about like taxation and things like that. And he's like, "Look, like you know, people when people have freedom to use their money and contribute it to whatever they want, like we get to see like what people actually believe in, what they care about, but we don't get to see all the times what happens like." when the money goes to other things that supposedly say that they're going to go to fix this or fix that. And then it's like, where's the money? Why, you know, why is there like all these problems and we still don't have roads fixed or this fixed. So totally. I think when you like, you know, it's empowering, like being an entrepreneur, having control of money and then being able to contribute that in a way that's meaningful that you care about, mm. you know, cause then people say like, well, what, what if we did that? What if everybody just gave money to, it's like, that's not going to happen because there's so many different and diverse people. Mm-hmm. You just really start funding what you love. And then that kind of just manifests. Right. I mean, mm. is there, is there any downside to that? Is there any like negative, like, <laughs> is there any reason why, like, you know, that, that this wouldn't work? I, I think it's totally, mm. Uh, totally possible that when people have control of their money and they feel empowered that they fund what they love and then we create a better world, world peace. There you go. That's going to be yeah, the title of the podcast. I mean, that's, that's really, world peace. What, you know, cause I mean, we've all seen this, especially in the last year, everybody loves to blame the external, right? Like, Oh, it's all, um, it's all Bill Gates's fault or it's, uh, What's his name? Jeff Bezos has too much money, which, yeah, dude, he could save this country if he just gave away some of his money to everybody. But still, like, I'm not I'm not one to blame the external for having all this money. It's more about, you know, instead of spending all that energy complaining about the the handful of the zero point zero 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 one percent on this planet, like, okay. it is what it is. But what are you doing? You know, what are you doing to contribute? And it doesn't mean that hey, you have to sacrifice your soul to make billions. It's not true. I'm friends with a few billionaires who are doing really great work and they're actually totally conscious, spiritually awakened, like very values oriented people who are actually creating systematic change. And I do believe that's where, you know, if we want to see the kind of world we want to see with the new changes where humanity and the earth are actually put first, then yeah, we need to get these kind of people into more power and more influence. And that includes everybody listening to this. You know, it's like if you're interested in psychedelics, that probably means there's something in you that's a little more awake than, you know, maybe the people who are slaving away at the system and just complaining and not doing anything and maybe numbing themselves with whatever it is, the internet or, you know, alcohol or social media. But instead, you know, how do you want to start contributing? And that could just be like, put your artwork out there, you know, <laughs> like yeah. follow, follow something that you've been wanting to do. It doesn't mean that everybody has to be a billionaire healthcare entrepreneur changing the system, but it does mean being, being really honest with yourself and not hiding that piece of you. And instead of spending all this energy complaining about the world, you know, you could spend that energy creating. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's so easy to complain too, you know, that's the thing. (laughs) It's it's so easy to just like take my iPhone with my uh, Che Guevara shirt that I bought online for $30 and just be like, capitalism sucks. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you know, like, but I mean, we all can agree that like definitely the system we live under, which yeah. I think is more like a crony capitalist system, you know, get really destroys these like small businesses, you know, the, the big, you know, you know, the whole deal. Yeah. Um. So it's like what, but like, there's always these arguments of like, well, communism, socialism, yeah. capitalism. It's like, what if there's an ism that doesn't exist yet? Like, what if there's something that we don't even know about yet? And I think maybe there's things like that emerging. I don't know. You look at like crypto, you look at like yes. NFTs and all this kind of stuff that's happening. I mean, even like new social networking, like Clubhouse, it's like such a different connection to people um, that can maybe facilitate, like, that's how we got connected. Yeah. So, you know, even though I was I was like aware of you, it's like, oh, well, I actually got to like pop in and hear her speak and just, you know, whatever. Um, so, so there you go. So, so what, what do you think? Do you have any like, um, feelings, thoughts, or just, you know, we could just wildly speculate here, of course, uh, free to do that. Um, but like, what, what, what do you think? Like, do you think there's something coming so that's, that's going to be like okay. a hybrid version or new version? This is totally what keeps me like feeling great every night for many, many years of, you know, like I used to be, high anxiety, like really stuck in that fear, you know, numbing myself with all the stuff kind of going in that downward place. But, you know, again, a lot of the medicine path has shown me for a very long time that, you know, and many people are aware of this, even without medicine, that we're building a totally new world, right? Because these structures are not working at all. Like we all know this. I mean, we're all in the system and there's, uh, there's very little in the system that I actually believe works. But we, none of us knows the answers. It's really interesting. Probably like you, I, I follow a handful of like really big thought leaders out there. And I'm like, oh my God, I wish they would just give us the answer. <laughs> I know, I'm like, nice email, nice article. What's the answer? But this is where it starts is these conversations about, okay, what could it look like? What do we need? You know, what does everybody desire? Um and I, I agree that there is not this one answer. Like it's all communism. Let's just go the opposite or, you know, this one you know, my, my partner, um, is Danish (laughs) and it's just so interesting. He comes from this country. It's totally different, but even then it's like, there's some problems over there too. You know, it's, I don't know if that's the right answer either. So I do believe that it's going to be, um, an interesting and probably bumpy ride for the next 10 years or so. Um, you know, according to astrology, they predict like by 2026, there will be major changes. So that's actually, a lot sooner, but I do believe that's only the beginning. Um, but then I don't know, things are moving really damn fast. I was just in Mexico visiting a friend and hanging out and, um, everybody's just buying up crypto there, like left and right, you know, which I think everybody here is as well. Um, yeah, but I, I've always said, it's like these systems need to crumble and that that's the only way we're going to build these new systems, but we don't know what they're going to look like. And I think, just having these open conversations and the more people who are, again, this comes back to like, okay, well, who's, who's going to be in charge of this? You know, where are the values going to come from? If we leave it as all the people who are currently in charge, I don't know, we're going to end up with the exact same system, right? Mm-hmm, this mm-hmm. is why I believe it's so important to have, you know, these conversations, get your voice heard out there, start talking to more people, having, you know, whatever word we want to use, awaken leaders or, um, you know, people with more consciousness behind their work, start, you know, gaining influence and gaining power and having their voices heard because that's where the change starts to happen. So I don't know. I mean, you know, um, (laughs) I've said when I was young, probably in my, so I'm in my forties, I remember about 20 years ago, telling my friends that in our lifetime, psychedelics would be legal. And they thought I was absolutely insane. And I was like, no, it's, it's totally, it's like, and this was before marijuana was even becoming legal. And I knew I was like, it's guaranteed. It has to happen. This is it's evolution. It's only natural, right? Like we can't keep it's, it's the law of nature is expansion, you know, trees grow and grow and grow. And this is how nature works. And it's the same thing with everything on our planet. So you know, I've been saying for years that there might be a day where money isn't 
around anymore, but maybe it's just, it looks different, you know? I mean, we're already seeing this with, with things like crypto and, um, you know, blockchain technology, I think has so much possibility behind it. Trust me, lots of prayers there. Um, but we don't know. I just, I do believe that the more people hold on to this false sense of security, you know, right. Yeah. Even watching my partner, like stalking cash, I, I, Love him, but I was laughing. I was like, what you do? That cash might not be worth <laughs> anything. Like, why stock yeah. it? You know, like to me, I'm like, oh, I'd rather just stock like land that I can have a garden on. Like that to me is more important than a pile of paper that we all agree on that might be worthless tomorrow. Um, it's the yeah. same thing with, you know, it's interesting with the way the world is. Like you mentioned social media and clubhouse and these new Platforms. I have been saying this for years. I have an email from 2016 or 17 that I wrote to my email list saying, you guys, there's probably going to be a day where Facebook and Instagram doesn't exist. And of yeah. course, people don't believe that. But the, these platforms are changing so much every day that I have never believed in having all your eggs in a one basket, you know, because we've already seen this. Like I was alive at the, the height of Friendster, you know, or MySpace. I was on MySpace for however long, and then now. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? It's like we don't top know. seven friends. Yeah, we have no <laughs> idea, and that's where I always say the best thing you can do is really, you know, I, I really believe in like coming into your own sovereignty, like taking care of yourself. Don't depend on anyone or anything or any government for your whatever it is that you're depending on them for. Like, go create your own your own money, your own food, your own sources of, of something, your, your communities. And it's the same thing with everything else. It's like there is, everything is completely impermanent in life, you know, including mm -hmm. the way our world is changing. If you stop and look, it's, it's growing exponentially. You know, it's like, look at Clubhouse it was not even been a year and it's, I don't know how many million users they're up to now. Like, and they haven't even launched on Android yet, you know? And it's like, right, yeah. that's just one of many platforms coming too. I mean, we all know right. it's going to be, you know, different iterations and like maybe new ways of communicating. So yeah, this, I think it'll be really, I mean, I keep saying this is, I'm so excited to be alive right now. I mean, it's definitely not easy. I get it. Like it's definitely an intense time to be alive, but I also believe it's also exciting to watch the world potentially changing, like completely transforming right in front of our eyes. Like totally live in a completely, I mean, we will live in a completely different reality and you know, who knows, 10, 20, maybe even six years. Who knows? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, definitely. Well, it is exciting, right? It's, I mean, it, and it's like, why would you, why do you want to live in an easy time? I mean, that's boring, right? I mean, so as, as, as long, you know, but, but there's this thing of um, impermanence. I think this is the root of it all, right? It's like, this is the, the root of it all. And this is where I think the, the plant medicine work uh, can c come into play or, you know, any sort of s getting yourself into an altered state, going within, being at peace with just breathing and sitting, mm -hmm. you know, these kinds of things. Um, because we strongly have this, this fear of, things changing. We don't, we don't want to, we don't want to, most people don't want to like, they can't our, our relationship with death. Right. And that's like, like you were saying, these systems are crumbling, but like, you know, the other day, my friends and I were, uh, on some wonderful, uh, tea, uh, some, some beautiful tea and, uh, mushroom tea. And we we're looking at this, the garden that I have in the back of my house where, there's some decay from the squash, you know, from the winter, but now spring is emerging. All that decay, all that growth, all of that, you know, kind of ugly, nasty stuff is going to flourish again. It's going to come again. So it's like being okay with this kind of creation and destruction and this, you know, this, this change. So I think that if you're, you know, creating a business, if you have business ideas and you're getting involved with plant medicine work, it's almost like, like really leveling up to kind of like, I don't know, can't think of a better phrase, but like join the fight to bring the light, you know, like something like that. <laughs> totally. No, it's, it's interesting. I've said this a lot and I actually just said it a few weeks ago, but I, I do believe that one of the reasons psychedelics have grown in popularity so much the last, you know, especially the last few years, but you know, last 20, 30, 40 years 
I actually believe that one of the number one lessons they teach us is to learn how to sit in that discomfort yeah. of impermanence, the crazy changing times that we're entering into, the fear of death. Like when COVID hit, I was just like, oh, okay. Like I was not surprised because these medicines have shown that something was bound to happen. Um, astrology has predicted this. I always tell people, you know, there was a group of astrologers that did a whole summit in 2016 or 2017 called Preparing for 2020. Oh, you can no, I didn't it. know that. It's amazing. and But it's like, so when this hit, I was just like, oh, you know, okay, here it is. And all I could do was sit. And I actually wrote an email to my list called, um, it was called like the world's longest ayahuasca ceremony. And of course, yeah. that was only in like April. <laughs> and that was right. Like, it's, it's still a gigantic ayahuasca ceremony. But yeah, I mean, that and I, you know, I, I'm a very big believer in meditation and I've done a lot of silent retreats and Vipassana and it's the same thing. It's all about just that letting go, you know, and it's the hardest thing for the human mind to do, but that practice, you know, imagine if everyone could just come to peace with it, maybe things would be very different right now. You know, like that's, that's one thing I keep questioning. I mean, of course, I don't want to see extreme death, but I'm like, okay, I finally said to myself this summer when I kind of hit my breaking point of isolation where I was like, you know, I think I would actually rather die by living my life a little bit than sitting at home by myself and thankfully, you know, with a great partner. But still, I was like, I'm getting really antsy. I need to like get out a little bit. <laughs> and and yeah. I was like, wait, so people would rather not live their life for many, many years to hide from death then potentially die and go live life. I don't know. Right. That's well, yeah, it's the same thing as like you said before, going to the top of the mountain by yourself and like yeah. leaving it all behind. It's like, there's nowhere to run. There's nowhere to hide. Like we're in this thing, you know, and the best way to go about it is to keep put like taking steps and putting action out there. And, you know, I know you, you, you also talk about like spiritual activism, right? Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I'm curious because I had a thought the other day. I was actually talking with uh, Laura Dawn um, about this and LD and, uh, and about like reciprocity, right? Like I saw Seth Rogen, I think like tweeted something about like he's got like a cannabis company coming out. And for whatever reason, the idea came to my mind. I was like, all these people that are like starting companies and stuff like that, it, is there anything, are they thinking about like contributing money to help expunge criminal records, get people out of jail? Like, are you seeing anything like, like that kind of reciprocity happening with, with, uh, some, I know the big guys, right? Like, you know, like maps and, and places like that, but what about like some, some more of the little operations that are happening or even just people you're talking with, like ways that we can kind of, you know, do things to, to fund legislation and get the war on drugs, you know, ended and, and these kinds of things. Yeah. I mean, I hope that someone like Rogan is putting money back into, you know, I don't know what kind of company it is, but yes, I would really hope that he's giving it back. And I do believe in sacred reciprocity and whatever. I, I actually believe that every human has this capability. You know, I mean, I don't care if you're broke, like back when I was totally broke, I still went and volunteered once a week at this, this, I don't, you might even know it. God's love we deliver in New York city and help make food. Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah there was an amazing organization. They made food for homebound New Yorkers. And it was actually really fun. I just like chopped vegetables for a few hours. So there's always a way to give back on all levels. Like whether you're the Bill Gates of the world or you're just, you know, someone like me is making pretty good money. And it's like, I always think about, okay, where do I want to put my energy and my money and my voice, you know? So even if you don't have money, I, the people that are out there speaking up or getting involved or writing letters or, um, you know, helping spread the message, you know, if you want to be involved in decriminalization, but yes, you can't donate $500,000 like Bronner's can. Hey, there's so many on the ground places you can get involved, you know, like yeah. put your... I always say like, this is what I've done throughout my life is I just put my skills to work. Every time I volunteer for something, I'm like, Hey, I'm really good at, you know, the tech background or the marketing or this or that, or helping with the writing or, you know, I've always been very good at like gathering people together and, um, organize, you know, organizational work. So I do believe in that reciprocity that it can come from so many different directions. And of course it's interesting. I've heard so many of these arguments over like, 
well, we should all just quit drinking ayahuasca because it's actually bad, you know, for the indigenous community. I'm like, you guys, first of all, I believe that most of the people saying that have never been near an indigenous person. The indigenous community that I work with down in Peru has been suffering for the last year. Why? Because none of us have been there. They haven't been hosting any, you know, groups that I know of. Maybe some other people are, but not the, the person I work with. So that community is actually, um, you know, they need money. They, you know, the, the false belief is that these indigenous communities live off the land and grow all their own food and they just like sleep outside. And I'm like, dude, no, they, they all like buy food, like, like the rest of the world. Like there's very few communities left on this planet that are truly like so indigenous that they don't like, they're not part of our world. But the reality is like, even, um, I support a lot of my friends go and do sun dance and moon dance with the native elders, you know, once a year. And some actually went in 2020 and one of them said something, they were collecting donations and they said, look, um, some, if you donate tobacco to this elder, tobacco doesn't put gas in their car. And I was like, wow, it's so nice to hear. And these are other elders that I work with saying this. And they're like giving the reality of like, we're collecting donations for our native elders because they still have to buy food. They still live in, you know, they're living in America or Canada or, or Mexico where they still do need things like fuel and, um, you know, medicine and band-aids when their kid gets a cut. I mean, let's, you know, like, let's get real yeah. here. Right. So I donated money to them and I was like, you know, I really wish people could truly understand what this reciprocity is about. So it's not about like take all the, you know, everything off of the earth because, you know, you're pillaging. I, I don't believe that. I believe that these medicines are actually here for us at this time in human history for a reason. And there's a reason why they've spread across the entire planet. And I do believe then it wakes us up to then question like, oh, okay, how do I live in balance? How do I give back? Where is this sacred reciprocity? It's not about like not allowing others to have it because that's actually scarcity mindset. That's the complete opposite. But if you live from the abundance mindset of, okay, and even Trisha, Trisha Eastman had a really great point about this as well. Like it's not, it's not about like don't do combo because it comes from a frog it's about how do we balance this all? And then how do we also get into balance with the companies that are now trying to patent certain things? And like, you know, we have to, I would, you know, and she said this too, um, spend more time worrying about the people out there that are looking to, um, like, that's like the real colonization, you know, like the, the new companies popping up with billions of dollars that are like, well, how are we going to own psychedelics? You know, I don't believe that they're all doing this. I do believe some of them are, but, um, yeah, that's, yeah. those are to me, like the real conversations where they, because honestly, it's like, I'm a peon compared to this, you know, $15 billion hedge fund that's funding psychedelics. Mm -hmm. So I'm mm -hmm. doing my part, but it's like, well, on a greater scale, we need to get to those, those people who are like, okay, well, and thankfully, there are people out there doing good work. Like when I interviewed Paul Stamets, he had said um, he has put in protective patents in place for, I guess, certain strand, strains of psilocybin. That's He was a little wishy-washy about it, but that's what I understood it. So it's like, okay, well, that's someone who's, you know, he's probably worth a lot of money and he's doing really good things to protect the plants, you know? So mm -hmm. I do believe everybody, if every human on this path brings this to mind when they go to purchase something, when they go to join in something, you know, ask the questions like, where, where is this grown? Who is this money go to? Like, I literally see where my money goes. Cause I, I'm go down there and I see the community, you know? So I think it's, and I've said this for years, even with my last business, I used to write a lot about conscious consumerism. So it's not about just quit buying everything ever, but it's about how do you make better decisions when you, you know, like decide to spend money on something, you know, who are you supporting? Like, even when I go to buy, like quite literally yesterday, I bought something where I actually saw the same product on Etsy. And then I saw it on Amazon and I actually knew this artist I was buying it from. I know her work and the Amazon product was, um, $12 cheaper. And I was like, 
But the Etsy product, I, I know how Amazon's pricing structure works. And I was like, well, you know, I can afford to pay a little more. I'm, I'd rather her get the money directly than it. I mean, at the end, she probably gets like $3 from Amazon, you know? So yeah, it's like, yeah. make conscious decisions and question like, okay, do I, and it's, you know, Tim Ferriss's article about not doing this and do all the synthetics instead. I'm like, I personally believe it's not about saying no to doing combo. I, I would say it's about, well, how much combo do you really need? Do you really need to do it every week for the rest of your life? Do you need, need, need it once a month? You know, right. maybe not. That's where, like, I've done, I haven't done combo in like four years, you know? Yeah. And that's where I believe it's not about like gripping and, and saying like, oh no, ayahuasca isn't for you. But it's about like, okay, do you need to drink ayahuasca like every single weekend? No, probably not. A couple times a year? Sure. You know, are the people you're getting it from sustainably harvesting and growing it? You know, ask the questions. Mm -hmm. So I think mm -hmm. there's a lot of different conversations. And of course, this is this this is going to be so funny because some people get so triggered by this. I've gotten I've gotten a handful of haters over the years, like telling me that medicine should just be free. And I'm like, do you know how these things are not easy to grow and harvest and distribute? You know, like making ayahuasca is actually a huge, long, painful process. Like it's it takes a lot of human labor. Same with psilocybin. I don't know how many people have found mushrooms growing in their yard. I would love to know. I never have, and I've lived all over. <laughs> so even when someone grows psilocybin, it takes a lot of human effort to put some time and energy into making sure they're they're not tainted and that they're good to go and that they're you know grown the right way. It's like this is where all of these questions come into play. So yeah, the sacred reciprocity conversation is. It's going to be huge, definitely, over the next few years, I hope. And I hope more people are having it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, definitely. I, I, I was um, – I'm right there with you. And and I, I was talking with someone recently about about this. And um, I was just saying how – you know, this is this is the language of our time. So for psych for psychedelics to be introduced in this kind of like, you know, I mean, this is the system we live under, and in you know, companies, corporations, patents, these kinds of things. It's only natural that, pun intended, I guess, mm -hmm. it's only natural that that people try and commodify nature or the natural yeah. or the sacred or whatever it is because. It's just that's the sort of language that we're used to. That's where this is what we're familiar with. This is the the programming, the code that we're operating on. But like you said, similar to your point of don't leave your job to start something new. Just we're gotta kind of like be on this train for a little bit until it's time to jump on the horse. Yeah. And like you know, that's yeah. I've heard I've heard some people that make some good arguments uh, for you know, for both sides. And, yeah. and I think that there's, there's, th there it is again. It's that, that middle ground, yeah. that nuance. Can we ask questions without people yelling at us? Can we have productive uh, conversations that lead to the, the building of something new? I think, I think it's possible. Yeah. And I'm always surprised when I see people in the kind of psychedelic conscious spiritual place with like that charged energy of like, well, you can't, and you can It's like, don't you know that like the it's infinite creation, it's yeah. abundance. We're not going anywhere. Yeah. Nothing's getting destroyed. Everything's malleable. It's all going to readjust. And you know what? The the probably the worst thing that could happen is that we blow up the whole planet <laughs> with nuclear weapons. Yeah. But even so, the planet will still be here. Yeah. It'll be fine. We'll be gone. But you know. <laughs> I love it. Either way, we're getting back to one. <laughs> I, it's totally, I know it's so funny. I interviewed Susan Weed, who's this really amazing, but like intense herbalist. She's pretty well known. And she was like, we don't need to save the earth. And I was like, huh? And like, but she said the same thing. And it's true. She's like, we're going to self-destruct ourselves, maybe. Yeah. Like humans will, but the earth, huh? It's true. And I'm like, ah, it's so interesting but this is like this larger scale problem of, okay, there's a lot of people who are not looking inside, who are just readily spewing. And we've seen this so much in the last, you know, especially the last year, but everybody who's pointing everything outward, you know, like, let's just blame this and this and this and you and, and that girl, Beth, who writes about psychedelics and, ah, uh, 
And I'm like, wait, you know, how are you acting? That's all you have to worry about right now. Like start with within, start with your own questions, start with your own value system, you know? And yes, then yeah. we'll talk about it, you know, go have conversations. If you're so, you know, this, I, and again, the haters are so minor. It's like one every, I get one every few months, maybe out of mm -hmm. thousands. But when I, when I get them, it's usually people who are anonymous, which I find really funny. I'm like, okay, they don't even use their real names. They're like scared. <laughs> so I'm like, but you could actually spend that energy, like go create a whole website about it, you know, go write about it, go speak on podcasts about it. If you're that angry, mm -hmm. you know, create your own podcast about it. Sure. But, right. Yeah. It's usually something within them. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's kind of usually what it, and like, it's usually something that they haven't inspected or they can't look, they can't look at or haven't thought about with themselves. And they're just like blasting it onto you. Yeah. yeah I remember I got, I got one re, um, uh, well, not too recently. I haven't, I haven't gotten too many haters recently, which is nice, <laughs> but I did get one, uh, that said like, you know, um, so I, okay, like trigger warning or controversial <laughs> topic coming up, be prepared. But obviously my audience doesn't give a shit. So, um, but, but it's, it's, uh, I, I posted something about like the Tuskegee experiments, mm. um, and how you're familiar with this, yeah. like in the, the, they injected a lot of, uh, African Americans, yeah. uh, black people with, um, uh, syphilis and lied to them and everything. Um, horrible, horrible situation. Yeah. Not even really that long ago in the grand know, scheme of things. Crazy. Right. And so I posted something about this because I've, I actually have been in a lot of clubhouse rooms where there's a lot of you know, uh, there's a lot of conspiracy, th uh, talk. Um, and it's usually, or the, the ones that I've been on, it's with black people, but you don't mm. get that in the news media and stuff. It's always like the MAGA hat wearing white guy or whatever, yeah. but it's like, look, like, like they have a lot to be skeptical of. Oh, right. Yeah. I mean, like, you know, anybody who's had like their people mistreated by governments or c corporations, like there's a fair <laughs> dose of like concern. So I posted this thing about the Tuskegee experiments and the needles and all this, all this stuff. And someone was like, you know, I like your show, but like, you're going to give psychedelics a bad name. <laughs> like you're going to like, you're going to like take down, like you're going to ruin things for us. Like you got to like not do this. It's like really destructive. You're going to like hurt people. And I was just like, wow, I, I don't, understand where this is coming from, but I'm just trying to like provoke thought and ask questions. And I think it's okay to do that. And I think that anybody that is resisting that there's obviously, obviously something, you know, within them yeah. that they're afraid to confront or look at. It's that's, that's going to be one of the, the, the themes over <laughs> however long this is going to go on. I'm like, I, you know, and I don't even know who's out there even talking about it unless it comes up like this, where I agree that people need to start looking inward and doing their own depths, you know, the depths of that work. That's like, first of all, it doesn't feel good to be triggered. You know, it's like, do people really enjoy this? I don't know. I don't get it. This is why I've been very, um, you know, I'll speak up about certain things, but generally, I've been kind of that observer that just looks back and laugh because I'm like, it's, it's not even worth my energy to get yeah. into that kind of like rah, 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 when it's, you know, we all know it's like there's depths of unhealed wounds inside these people that, you know, the guy was like, you shouldn't be talking about medicine. It should be free. I'm like, well, okay. He has like deep scarcity and, and, you know, like mindset wounds around, you know, like, like abundance or whatever it is or availability or, um, whatever. So yes, I completely, <laughs> I agree. This is, a, this is a very interesting world that we're entering into. Um, you know, I, I do believe that people will have to do the inner work because this is, it's not sustainable to just be constantly like separating and dividing and pointing fingers at one another because, you know, it's like, that's not doing any good at all, really. Like this, you know, even the whole cancel culture thing has been really interesting to sit back and watch. Um, cause I, you know, I have very mixed feelings. I'm like, yeah, speak up for things that you don't, you know, agree with, of course. But at the same time is the answer to, um, cancel everything. Like there was something weird the other day that someone had commented on and it was, um, 
Oh, it was an artist. And I was like, dude, I don't even think you knew the artist's background. And there was a comment that just said, you shouldn't use this because it's depict- depicting indigenous people. And I'm like, wait, but I don't think he knows the artist's background. You know what I mean? It's just right. interesting. I was like, oh, this ju- this just happened with uh, comedian Bill Burr. He got he got in tr- like like Twitter, and who knows if this is even real or not? If it's like bots, sock accounts, like yeah. That- but like it was like you know the, the media always tries to drum up outrage because obviously like clicks and 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 money, you know that kind of thing. And it's like you know so that's the current programming they were in, and they're just kind of following the incentive structure of what works and things like that. Uh, but uh, but but yeah, Bill Burr like didn't really say anything that uh, like at all that was worth of like cancel culture, like are, are worth of uh, talking about canceling. And someone, um, so he, someone said like, he's a racist and yes, even though he is married to a black woman, he can still be a racist and he like, he's like owning her and all this stuff. And so Bill Burr's wife, Nia found this, this tweet, saw it and just retweeted like, please like shut the fuck up. Like, this is ridiculous. Like, what are you even trying to dig for? But it gets back to maybe this thing of like, you know, people wanting to have a voice and an attention and it's the attention economy and got to have a take and you got to, you know, be mixing it up or something like that. And um, so, like you said, it's like, it's going to be a bumpy road. It's going to be messy, you know, but I think, uh, (laughs) <laughs> we'll we'll get we'll get through it. Um, People need yeah. to get off the internet for a moment, you know. Yes, just like go outside or something. I mean, it's it's so. I'm like, oh my god, you, it's and it's it's sad because I've seen some people just afraid to speak. Period. You know, like I had a a client who a year ago was saying something like, "I'm afraid to share about my Reiki healing because I'm white and I'm afraid I'm culturally appropriating." And I was like. Because you went and studied like this energy healing that has roots in Japan. Like, I don't, you know, okay, I okay, call it something else. So, you know, I was like, really? Is this what's happening? Like now I can't say namaste at the end of yoga anymore. Like, come on, no. Like there's there's a point where it's like getting a little insane, and I don't think it's healthy for anybody. And I do think, I think in a way, like it's this this is where I say it's this gigantic ayahuasca where everybody's just purging and purging and purging. And then they're going to see like, Oh, okay. Like this isn't really helping and this isn't working or maybe I've got it all out and now I'm tired and screw it. I'll just get off the internet altogether. Or, you know, I won't get involved in these like, you know, bashing people over like the simplest things, like, especially when you jump to conclusions, you know, that's where I'm like, did you even know this woman's background before you just jumped at right. her painting? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you don't have time. You got to get that, get it out there. Cause it's, you know, in the, but, but yeah, I mean, I, I was just thinking of the, the medicine work, plant work, ayahuasca, like, d- you know, these kinds of things, they don't, they don't cancel, you know, there's the, that energy of like cancel culture, like hide something away, ban them. Cause it's bad. That is not, that is, you know, like a spiritual bypassing, right? It's like, we need to like bring the shadow aspects up, like talk to them, interact with them, sit, sit down, have tea with them and accept them and then integrate, work to integrate them. Um, totally. Yeah. So it's like, it doesn't really connect when you, when you're on that, you know, trying to cancel and then you're in this kind of line of work and stuff like that. Speaking of, of integration, um, I think that you're listed on the psychedelic integration list uh, at, at Maps. Oh, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I was I was uh, you know as mm-hmm. as a business coach um, mm-hmm. that you that you are like with with entrepreneurs on the medicine, and it's not just strictly entrepreneurs on the medicine path, but that's kind of like the majority of people you work with, right? Yeah, I mean, majority of people I work with are people looking to start or grow their business. Um, you know, once in a while, I get a client that's like. I just need to figure out my purpose or I want to find what's next for me. Um, so I help people really come into that. And I do believe that even the even the, the process of starting your own business is always going to be that deeper level, you know, inquiry into like, what am I here to do? Who am I really? Because when you come out on this deeper level and you come into a new way of being, like starting something new, it leaves you with no choice then to evolve, you know, it always happens. Um, 
my clients always transform and it's always beyond just their business. It's like, yes, their business gets started and it grows and makes money. But then there's always these other things that are unexplainable, you know, like um, I've had people like fall in love, meet their partner, you know, move somewhere new, manifest a new home, get these like random opportunities that just show up. And I do believe it's this, this mm-hmm. alignment of like when you're really listening to what's inside of you, like things just start to flow a lot easier, you know? I mean, yeah, it's not always easy. Of course, there's ups and downs, like everything in life. But yeah, that's the majority of what I do. And also, yes, integrating this work into what is it that you're doing with your day-to-day life. Um, the one thing I will say is through that maps that maps listing, I actually get more inquiries of people literally just saying, hey, do you know where I can get psychedelics? So that's upsetting. <laughs> I usually just delete. So if you want to learn where to get psychedelics and you email me, I will just delete your email. Um, You know what? The one other thing a lot of people ask is about psychedelic assisted therapy, which unfortunately there's such a demand and there's not enough supply right now. Yeah. Um, You know, so I get people asking and then I usually send them to, (laughs) I usually send them to my partner who is a non-psychedelic therapist. He's a somatic body-based therapist. Oh, awesome. But you know, it's, it's, it's good and bad because, you know, I, there are a lot of people I work with who do, um, quote, underground work as I don't, I don't know a better way to call it. Um, but the reality is, let's be honest. I think all of us know this, that there's underground work happening everywhere. You know, it's, yeah. unfortunately the laws are not changing quick enough for the demand, the training, the maps provides, and I know there's some others, but very few, there's, I mean, even Rick Doblin, everybody at MAPS has agreed to this, that the demand is so high, but no one can keep up. Like, it's this industry, quote, is not moving fast enough for the amount of people who want psychedelics. Um, or, yeah. But it's, but I always say it's not about the psychedelic, you know, that's part of it. But then it's everything else, you know, it's like, yes, psychedelic assisted therapy is great. But again, even Rick Doblin said it's not. It's not the psychedelic experience, it's the day-to-day work, the integration, the, you know, working with a somatic therapist and doing daily meditation and getting the proper exercise and, you know, rebalancing your diet and cutting out what's not serving you. I mean, there's so much more to it than just go do some psilocybin, hope that it gets rid of your depression and voila, your life has changed. I mean, I wish that was the case. There's nothing, I mean, nothing I know of has completely like gotten rid of anything for anybody like even a boga mm-hmm. you know it's like you hear yeah. these miracle stories but then i'm like i don't know you're kind of similar to how you were six months ago so right the reality yeah. is the integration you know <laughs> Ex- exactly yeah yeah integration is important yeah i was i was just wondering like because i i hear the the word a lot and you know, it, it looks like different things. And so like, what does it look like from your perspective um, when somebody is wanting to manifest something in a, uh, in a, in a, with a business, you know? Yeah. So it's like, I got all these insights, you know, I meditate, I exercise, you know, I microdose, um, I journey every so often and things like that. And, you know, I want to create a business and it's like, okay, cool. What, what is like, uh, I don't know, maybe this is a dumb question, but it's just like, I, I guess I'm trying to think of like, what does integration mean in this kind of like, in this lane yeah. specifically? No, it's a great question because this is what I get. I get, you know, a lot of my clients have worked with, a lot of people are very similar to me where they've worked with psychedelics for a long time and gone very deep on the path. And then they kind of reach this breaking point. Um, where they're like, look, I like, and this is another one. I've gotten a lot of people who've invested in trainings and breath work, you know, somatic training, Tantra, um, you know, psychedelic integration programs, you know, different forms of their own healing. Like they've done work, like all this work on themselves and, you know, done all these classes. And then they're like, okay, I still haven't started a business and I'm really miserable with my current job. And, you know, I've been on this path for a long time. Like it's time, you know, they're, they're looking around them. They see that the world could really use their help. 
And then they come to me when they're ready to like finally take that step. And they're like, you know, I hear this a lot. Um, There's a fear, there's imposter syndrome. That's a big one. Or they just don't know what to do first, right? So you've done 10,000 trainings, including whatever it is, coaching, healing, blah, 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 even psychedelic integration coaching training. And then what? You know, then how do you turn it into a proper business where you're actually helping people and transforming lives, but then also making money off of it? And that's where I take them through a very simple process. It's literally step by step process, you know, whether it's private or in my group programs, it's a very similar process no matter which program you're in, because Each little step leads to more results. And through the steps, you know, there's a reason for all of them. But what happens is kind of like this, I always say it's kind of this like secret byproduct is you start to transform. Like it's, you know, it's inevitable. You start to become freer and more liberated because you're becoming a different, more authentic version of yourself. So for example, I don't know why I've attracted a lot of people who've come from the Western medicine realm over the years, nurses, doctors, nurse practitioners, people kind of in that system. And then they want to go into like the quote alternative realm, like functional medicine or um, integrating psychedelics into coaching or health and nutrition or breath work. And so they've gone and done all the training and then they're like, okay, I can't stay on my job anymore. How do I get this started? That's where they come to me. And through it, the liberation is you being true to yourself, you know? And it's like, when you start to take that step, that very first step I teach, it actually has you see, it's this this whole process, you start to have confidence in yourself pretty much right away where you realize like, wow, there is a group of people out here that I know I can help. Because I just spoke to them. I, I'm listening to what they're going through. And I'm here up on this mountain. I always use this analogy. Like there's this mountain that everybody's climbing. And you're here at 3,000 feet. And your potential clients are down here at 1,000 feet where you were maybe five years ago or 10 years ago or even three years ago. And when you realize, when you look behind you on that mountain and you realize even if it's 20 people or 10 people, I mean, you can have a huge business with 20 people or 10. Mm -hmm. Like you can Mm -hmm. actually have a six figure business, which is a handful of people, but it's not even that it's that you're creating impact in these people's lives where those people are stuck. They don't know what to do. They've tried everything. You know, think about all the people who are turning to psychedelics. A lot of them are the people who've tried antidepressants or they've tried traditional therapy or they've, you know, done all the different things, but they haven't broken through on a new level. Well, you know, now they're hearing about it. And so they're the ones looking for, okay, ready to go deeper. So it's like, that's where your business is. And through that, that's where you start to really come in yourself. You gain the, you know, the trust in yourself, the imposter syndrome starts to melt away. You start finding your voice. You know, it's, I I really believe it's a deeper level of stepping into your you know, divine purpose. Um, and through that, you know, that's where it becomes, I always said when I came fully out of the psychedelic closet and just went like, I don't give a fuck. I'm just going to go call this thing psychedelics and business. It was like a freedom that I had never felt before. I was like, Oh, now I'm not hiding that tiny little, I was hiding 2% of my life, you know? And years ago it was like hiding my astrology. And then I was like, fuck it. I'm going to start talking about astrology. Who cares? Like, I know enough people, I don't, it doesn't matter if the masses like it. It matters if 10 people like it, you know, or 20. Yeah. <laughs> like, right. you know, this isn't about like speaking to the masses. It's about speaking to your people and that's it. So that's the process I teach. And that's where the integration comes in because a lot of these people are like, well, I saw this. I, one of my former clients had said for years, like, oh, I kept seeing, you know, every time I went into a journey, I kept seeing that I'm really here to do this, this one form of functional medicine. She went and studied this one niche thing. And it's like, okay, well, how many reminders do you need to get? And then she went through my program. I actually, she just reached out to me recently and was like, you know, things are on fire. She's been doing this and this and podcasts and launches and new programs. I mean, she just, it's only up from there, but those first steps are the hardest ones for most people where it's like, 
that first step. But when you're in a container where you're being held and where I'm giving you like these little steps, like that's the integration. And then I actually, you know, believe it or not, I don't talk about this a lot, but I do bring in a lot of other modalities into my work. So yes, while I do focus on business mostly, I bring in a lot of somatic work, you know, like body based, you know, just cause I've, that's been a huge part of my own integration path. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Yeah. Like it's to me, one of the best modalities there is. And then, you know, also, um, other like, you know, woo woo type things, which I don't think are woo woo, but you know, the daily practices, daily meditation, chanting, writing, journaling, um, taking care of your body, going out in nature, like literally go sit by a tree. You get more answers sitting by a tree than Googling for your answer. You know, Mm -hmm, it's not mm -hmm. complicated. Um, I think most of the problem is, this happens with mostly like new clients of mine. Everybody gets so caught up in their head and caught up in the fear. And when you have support to quiet your fears and get out of your head and get into your body, which then allows the space for, you know, the intuition and the inspiration to come through, all you have to do is then follow the steps and voila, it becomes like magical almost, you know, I have a lot of clients report things And I actually usually, I I usually say to them like, well, you can just watch for all the synchronicities. Like as soon as they decide to join my program, like the energy shifts, you know, things start taking off even before they do anything. Like I've seen this happen for years and a lot of it, (laughs) yeah, yeah, it's just this energetic conversation with the universe that you're like ready. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we spoke, how long ago did we speak first on the phone? Yeah, I want to hear about this. Like three, two weeks, three weeks or something. Yeah. All right. So like two weeks ago and like, you're, first of all, amazing. Th- uh, th- thank you. And what you just said too, I was like kind of stumbling with like, oh, is this a good question? And you just like knocked it out of the park. So thank you. Um, and so, yeah, like just some simple thing. And I think it's just like your vibe, your energy, <laughs> like what you bring, like it's, that's important too. You know, it's like that, that matters. That makes a difference. It's just like with that transmission of this like authentic, pure joy for what you do and energy. And so I literally, I think I remember in the forum, like before we spoke, it said like, are you willing to do things that'll be uncomfortable? And I'm like, I'm like, I'll, I'll just write yes. Cause like, I want to talk to her. But then when we talk to you, you're like, yeah, yeah, do this or whatever. And then I'm like, okay, cool. So I literally sent an email out to like all the people on my list. And it was like a real simple one. It was just like, Hey, you guys know that I hate emails. I just want to know, like, are you in or out? Like for continuing down, like, and like people replied like, hell yeah, keep them coming. Like good to hear from you. And then, uh, so the podcast shot up in rankings. Um, and I got like, yes. um, I think ranked the highest ranking that I got to is 59, uh, overall in the philosophy category. Oh my God. So yeah, it was like really cool. I think it's a little down and who knows what, what these things are, but it was a cool moment. And I saw like some, you know, the downloads go up and things like that and more people commenting and stuff. But it was like literally just this like small energy shift and this small action oh that I had this story in my head that I was like, oh, this is so like uncomfortable or this is so weird or this is a big one. I don't want to be like that kind of guy yeah. that like does these things. And that's like what this guy does. And it's like, man, like we're all so unique. We all have our own like energy and our own element to bring. Yes. Like, so thank you for that. And uh, everybody listening. Um, yeah, this is, this is a, a wizard. Oh, magician I love it. Right here. I need to get on yeah. your email list. First of all, how did I miss that? Maybe I'm not on there. Um, Second, I know, trust me, I went through this big time. I mean, sometimes I still do. Like at some level, I mean, I don't love posting on social media every day. I don't love writing emails, but you know, I do. You write good emails. Huh? You have, I, I'm subscribed. I mean, you write good emails. I, do, yeah. I, I love telling stories, but the thing is sometimes I get uncomfortable. But what I do is I always come from a place of service because it's like once – once every couple of emails, there's at least one or two, sometimes a lot of people that write me, you know, random strangers, and they'll say, wow, I really needed to hear that. Or like, oh, thanks so much. Or, I mean, it's like, I always say to my clients, you don't know where, maybe you write something and you could save that person's life that day. Like maybe they were actually contemplating suicide and then you said something that made them shift. Like who, who knows? I mean, someone... Someone, this has happened to me multiple times during my, you know, darkest days in my life where 
someone would say one thing where I'm like, oh, okay, you know? So that's what keeps me going. It's not the ego-based, like, narcissistic, like, oh, let me see how many people, like, like my Instagram post. It's like, no, you know what? Let me just show up and serve. And hey, if it helps, great. If no one likes it, I don't care anyways. Like, it doesn't mean anything, you know? And same thing with podcast ranking. I think it's awesome they moved up because, hey, the more people you can reach, the better because these things are important. But at the same time, it's like, even if you're affecting like the lives of 10 people on this entire planet, that's huge, you know? And it's like, you never know yeah. one person. Like it could be one person that changes everything for you. Right. So, yeah, totally. Even the, the energetics of like shifting our energy to, and I, this is one of the first things I teach. And of course this comes up throughout everything I teach in my program because everybody gets caught up in like, <gasps> Oh, doing, doing a workshop or promoting myself or asking for money or whatever it is. But if you come from a place, it's all, you know, essentially what it comes down to, we've all been taught wrong. We've all been taught from this, this place of like, you know, we grew up in this society that was like, all grabby and money and like, you know, yeah. manipulative. Shame, and, scarcity. Yeah, yeah. Ads and sales and but then if we actually shift to a different way of living, which I would call like conscious business, like conscious entrepreneurship and coming from a place of service, like everything I do, I do so much free, you know, like free content, free trainings, free giving, giving, giving that's from a place of service so that, yeah, when I go ask for money, like it doesn't phase me, you know, because I know it balances it out. It's like, okay, I know not everybody can afford this one program, but that's why I have a completely affordable program or that's why I also do free things, you know, and there's, this is everything and I know, I know the feeling. I get it. Trust me. It's like, I have this thing with Facebook for some reason. I post on there, but half the time I'm like, uh, but you know what? It, there's people that say, like, there's people that once in a blue moon, I'm like, I don't even know you were following me, you know? Mm -hmm. And they're like, mm -hmm. wow, I really needed to hear that. Thanks so much. That was really helpful. That's yeah. all that we have to, you know? And it's like, so if you keep just doing that, but thank you. I'm so glad I could help. That makes me feel yeah. Cool. <laughs> yeah, totally. And uh, I have a feeling that th there'll be some people reaching out to you too from uh, this conversation because uh, this was awesome. So it was a real pleasure speaking with you. I mean, and, and like I just to repeat it again. I mean, it's like the energy that you bring. It's just like it's it's contagious. It's not. Well, I shouldn't say contagious. Infe no, there's infectious. infection. What's a what's a better word? <laughs> I'm, yeah. it's, my, it's, I'm like it's good. Fire. It's good. I'm yeah, so it's good. passionate about this work. I mean, I do, you know what it was too? It's like, I suffered for so long in a career that I hated, like self-destructing my life. And, you know, I don't like, I always say, look, if I could figure it out on like the way I did and, you know, with the means that I had and like, I didn't have anything given to me at all in a silver platter, I was just really like vigilant, you know, like I just did what it took and like sat through all the really uncomfortable times. And like, I mean, I have stories of laying on my floor crying, contemplating suicide multiple times throughout my adult life. But that's why I'm like, you know what? I know there is a way. I know there's a better way. And, you know, we're not here. I don't believe humans are here to suffer. That's not why we're here on earth. So, um, what are we here yeah. for? Yeah. <laughs> Well, that's, that's going to be the last, the last question as we wrap up and then you could tell people where to find you, but what, why are we here on earth, Beth? Um, I believe, you know, I would say it's this mix of share your gifts and shine your light and then just be happy. I mean, it's like, if you're not feeling, I work with this one healer who's constantly saying, if you're not feeling peace to joy, it's a sign to come back to your body and look at like, okay, well, what's, what's out of alignment that will bring me back to peace and joy. And it's not about spiritually bypassing. It's about allowing, you know, the quote bad feelings, but it is about, you know, when we recognize that we're given this one gift of life, it is impermanent. We don't know when it's going to end. It can end in an instant for all of us. You know, how do you want to live it? You know, I don't believe that we're here to live it as, suffering in anxiety and depression and being a slave to just survive, I believe there's a better way. So, um, yeah, I believe that that's, you know, shine your life, share your gifts and 
follow the path of joy. Amazing. <laughs> awesome. And uh, where can people follow your path? Where, where should we send them to? Thanks so much. So I'm at BethAWeinstein.com. I'm also on Instagram under BethAWeinstein. I am connected to Mike all over. I'm on Facebook. I'm pretty public. You can also find my summits at psychedelicsandbusiness.com, psychedelicsandpurpose.com. The Psychedelic Entrepreneur podcast will be coming out soon. I don't know when this is going to air, so maybe it'll be out by then. But um, but yeah, or just feel free to look me up and reach out and um, you know, let me know how I can support you. Amazing. Yeah, I highly recommend it. Thank you so much, Beth. Yeah, and I'll put all those links in the in the show notes uh, as well so you guys can uh, easily click and follow and find and ask and reach out. And uh, yeah, yeah, you're amazing. This was great. Aww. Thank you so much. And uh, this should be out soon. And then, yeah, excited to... Uh, uh, you know, see what you got cooking over there at the, at the new podcast. I always get excited when I think everybody should have a podcast, you know, cause it's just like the, it's a great way. So I'm always excited when, when new podcasts are in the space and, uh, when, uh, when you have like that going, I'll be sure to, you know, pump that out as well and, and promote that. Yes. And I can't wait to have you on as a guest. Oh, what? I get to be a guest. Yes. I'm, a, I'm an entrepreneur. Oh yeah, I am. Yeah. I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you cool. so much. It was an honor to yeah. be here. Thank you so much. Oh, likewise. Yeah. All right. That's it, folks. Peace. Hey, I hope you guys enjoyed that conversation as much as I did. I truly uh, was one of my favorite conversations that I've had recently. Beth is uh, really amazing. So go check her out, follow her and all that stuff. And go to sheathunderwear.com. Put in the promo code Mikeadelic. Get 20% off. That's 20% off. Uh, for the most comfortable pair of boxer briefs that you're ever going to wear. You will become enlightened from wearing sheath underwear. You will transcend into the eighth dimension from wearing sheath underwear. Sheathunderwear.com, Mike Adelic, 20% off. Do it. Check out the other things. Leave a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts. Help spread this message. Like, share, subscribe, all that good stuff. And go to patreon.com slash Mike Brank and join the Mikeadelic Inner Sanctum, the Discord chat, the patron, uh, the Patreon uh, membership includes bonus episodes, early releases, a lot of good stuff. We're building a great community of free thinkers and psychonauts and just a bunch of awesome, you know, people over there, diverse people group of people really uh really really uh enjoy it very much and i and i know you will too so thank you and until next time peace